Okay, so any questions? This is where we left off last time. Any questions from last time about any of the stuff we talked about? Now that you've had a chance to think about it and mull it over a little bit? That's fine. You got, I mean, you got like two and a half weeks or something to do this. So you got plenty of time. Um, yeah. We're going to do more of this today, but I just want to make sure if there was any concepts that like you pretended to understand but didn't actually understand and <laughs> we need to revisit because I'm about to move forward. Going once, going twice. Okay. So, uh, so here's the thing I want to remind you about decibels is decibels is not a unit of measurement that measures actual values. Okay? So decibels are not, it's not, you know, so yes, we could measure watts, right? Watts is an actual value of power. Decibel, if, if I say 10 decibels, that, is not, that does not represent an actual thing. That represents the difference between two things, right? That's all it does, is it just, when I say decibels, I mean that something is different from something else by this amount, okay? But it is not actually, that does not represent any actual value. Uh, however, you can get it to represent an actual value by doing what we call a reference levels and creating reference levels. And the idea behind a reference level, and here's the first one that we're going to talk about is dBSPL. The idea is if you can, as a community of like-minded individuals, uh, agree on some fixed spot that you will compare everything against, then you could start using decibels as a way to express actual values. Because uh, that decibel value is, is compared against something that you all agree is a fixed point. So if we want to use uh, decibels to express air pressure amplitude, for example, we have to somehow agree on an air pressure that is the starting point that we will compare everything against. And what we agreed, we, the people who do sound, uh, which means if you want to do sound, you have to agree to this too. Um, and if you don't agree, you don't get to do sound, okay? So you have to agree that zero dB SPL, SPL stands for sound pressure level. So zero, which is the thing we will call that the reference level, um, we are going to say that that is 20 micropascals of air pressure. Why 20 micropascals? Because that is generally understood to be the smallest amount of air pressure amplitude of a, of a sound wave that you know, a human ear could respond to. It's very, very quiet, though. Um, like You would have to be in a very, very quiet environment to even notice that that was happening. But your ears, most people's ears would respond just ever so slightly to 20 micropascals. So that is what we have sort of agreed is the starting point, that that's what we call the threshold of hearing. That's when sound begins, <laughs> for humans anyway. For other creatures, maybe it's somewhere else. But for humans, 20 micropascals. So if we can agree on that, then we can look at any other air pressure amplitude and see how different it is from 20 micropascals and express that in decibels, right? It is 10 decibels more than 20 micropascals. It is 80 decibels more than 20 micropascals. Or we could just say it's 80 dB SPL. And when we say dB SPL, we mean that number in dB SPL as compared to 20 micropascals. And then if you really wanted to know what that actual pressure was, you could do the math, right? And that at 80 dB SPL represents an actual pressure value uh, that is 80 dB more than 20 micropascals. So this way, we don't have to talk about, well, it is, you know, this is 3.2817685 pascals loud. <laughs> right? Instead, we could just say it's this many dB SPL. And that is, and we know that that is something. So just as a reference, uh, 
if, if 0 dB SPL, SPL is what we call the threshold of hearing, 120 dB SPL is what we tend to call the threshold of pain. And that's where, um, that's probably, you know, once you get much past 120 dB SPL, um, you know, that's going to be painful to most people. Like they're not, they're going to be very uncomfortable with that. I mean, you're going to be uncomfortable before that, but you're going to start getting hurt. <laughs> Like, it, it will cause you physical pain somewhere around 120. And, you know, you know, it gets louder than that, for sure, but it starts to hurt usually around 120. You start getting uncomfortable around 90, 95, I think. Most people are sort of like, eh, it's getting kind of loud. I'm not entirely comfortable with this scenario. Um, you get past 100 and you're like, yeah, I really think I should probably not be here. Uh, <laughs> And then you get to 120, and you're like, I am hurting now. You know, my ears are in pain. Okay, so dBSPL, SPL is a reference level, sound pressure level, uh, and this, uh, you know, dBSPLs respond to what we discussed last time as the inverse square law, where you know you double the distance, you drop 6 dB, you multiply the distance by 10, you drop 20 dB, right? That makes sense. Uh, so there's your first reference level, dBSPL. Any questions about that? Now we can actually use decibels to talk about actual loudness levels in the air. OK. Um, however, there's a catch. And that catch is that, uh, Remember that one time when I said that 0 dB SPL was the threshold of hearing, and that that was 20 micropascals. And the reason we know that is because that's when most people start ears start to respond. Well, it turns out that our sensitivity to sound is different depending on the frequency. So uh, that 0 dB SPL threshold of hearing is a little bit of an oversimplification because at what frequency is that the threshold of hearing? The answer, of course, is it depends. And it depends on the person, it depends on the situation, and it depends on a lot of things. But uh, there's been some research into this. Uh, and this research resulted in this chart, which I lovingly refer to as the most widely misunderstood chart in all of sound. Um, it's called the Fletcher-Munson Fletcher Equal Loudness Contours named after a guy named Fletcher and a guy named Munson who, brought, who you know, subjected a whole bunch of people to you know, listening tests and tried to figure out how they were, the sensitivity of their ears changed for frequency. And they found some interesting things. First of all, they certainly found that our sensitivity is different per frequency. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you look here at, you know, let's look at 60 dB SPL. So their reference was one kilohertz. Oops, come back. So one kilohertz was their reference. So they took 60 dB SPL of one kilohertz, assuming that zero dB SPL was 20 micropascals at one kilohertz. OK, that was their reference point. Uh, and they said, OK, if, if it's 60 dB SPL at one kilohertz, and that sounds to, this, to most people however it sounds, uh, it turns out that, uh, you know, like 100 hertz has to be actually 80 dB SPL in order to sound as loud as 1 kilohertz does. So, you have, so 100 hertz has to be 20 dB louder than 1 kilohertz in order for most humans to say those two frequencies sound the same level. That's, now, that's only for the situation where 1 kilohertz is 60 dB SPL, OK? They also found that if you go up to like 3 kilohertz, that 3 kilohertz needs to be a little bit quieter than 1 kilohertz in order to sound as, as though it's the same level. So 3 kilohertz needs to be, I don't know, 6 dB or so quieter than 1 kilohertz in order for most average humans to say, yeah, those are the same level. Isn't that interesting? I think that's interesting. Gets a little dicier, though, because they also found 
that that difference in sensitivity from frequency to frequency, the ratios change depending on the loudness. So at really low levels, you know, like all the way down here at these low levels, that ratio between 1 kilohertz to 100 hertz is, or even lower, is much higher, right? The difference, the, the amount that you have to turn up those low frequencies is much more at the low frequencies in order for them to sound the same level than it is when you get louder. So when you get up to 90 dBSPL at 1 kilohertz, now 100 hertz only needs to be 10 dB louder in order for most people to say that sounds the same. OK, so what does this mean? Well, it, mean, it, it means a lot of things. Like, there is a whole lot to unpack about this particular research. But one thing you need to understand is this is an average. These graphs are the average of all the people that they tested, which means from person to person, the, that graph would be different. This is, this is sort of an average. Um, but the other thing it means is that you, don't, you basically never actually know what it sounds like to the people who are listening. So you think about frequency response, and frequency response is a moving target. So as things get louder, things, you know, generally the sound starts sounding flatter in frequency response. And as you turn the sound down, the frequency response starts getting a little crooked in our perception. So all this work that you do to carefully EQ things and craft frequency response and everything, it's kind of difficult to land that plane because it's, it changes as loudness changes. So now think about this. Remember that, that term threshold of pain? So maybe, maybe you're the kind of person that says, I would like to not hurt people when they come to my shows. You maybe you're that kind of person. Well, the so then the question is, OK, if 120 dB SPL is the threshold of pain, which frequency is that? Because I could be below 120, kil 120 dB at 1 kilohertz, but be over 120 dB at 100 hertz and be hurting people, right? Because that's going to sound flat, but the actual pressure will be much higher. So what do we do about that, <laughs> right? Well, there, gratefully, there are greater minds than all of us that have put a lot of thought into this and try to figure out what does this mean and what do we do about this. And one of the things that they realized is that if we're going to try to enforce any kind of loudness standards or limits or whatever on live events or pieces of equipment or whatever, uh, we need to take this, these graphs into account, right? We can't just assume that all the frequencies are the same. And we can't assume that whatever that difference that we decide is, we can't decide that that's a fixed value, right? So uh, they created what are called uh, weighting curves for SPL meters. So you maybe have used an SPL meter before. Uh, it's a little thing you can hold in your hand, and you turn it on, and it tells you how loud something is, OK? It's magic. Uh, well, that thing's been calibrated, right? It's been calibrated against some sort of reference level, like we talked about, and it reads the air pressure that hits that microphone and figures out how much pressure that is that corresponds to at dBSPL. Was that like hit with an air compressor to break? Probably not, but um, no. but you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, so, uh, but remember that little microphone is listening to all the frequencies, right? So which one is it responding to? Can you fit SPL meters that like, only take like, the signal you're going to go down, for example? Or? No, but you can use these weighting curves. So the idea behind the weighting curves is all, most, almost every SPL meter will let you dial in a weighting curve. And usually the options are A or C. Sometimes you'll get a B. Um, and sometimes you'll get a no weighting. Um, but usually you'll have at least A or A and C. The idea here is that this is basically an EQ that you put on the SPL meter. 
okay? And it is meant to be the inverse of that Fletcher-Munson curve, okay? So this, these, these, these curves basically correspond to the frequency response of human hearing at various sound levels. So um, A weighting, for example, more or less conforms to the average frequency response of most humans for sound that is below 80 dB or so, 80 dB SPL, okay? And, um, you know, C weighting tends to correspond to the frequency response of human hearing for, you know, 90 to 100 dB or so or more. Uh, and then sometimes you get B, and B is a nice little middle point. You know, if, some, if you get that, that's really useful for that 80 to 100 range, I think. Um, but if you don't get that, use A weighting up to about 90 dB SPL, and then once it's louder than 90, switch over to C. The reason being is you want to make sure if you're measuring a number and you want to know if, you know, you've exceeded some noise threshold or something, that you're actually measuring something that corresponds to what the humans are hearing. You don't want to get dinged and say, oh, you're way over this thing because you, had a, you didn't have a weighting curve on your SPL, uh, and, there's, and you've got 100 hertz down there really blowing people away, but their sensitivity is way lower to that. And that's not the frequency that's bothering them. So you're not hurting them yet. So uh, you, that's, that's what the weighting curves are about. Um, super, super important. Um, really good uh, noise ordinances for like cities and stuff like that will include these weighting curves. Um, Right. Now, the noise ordinance in Winston-Salem is horrible. I read it, and it's ridiculous. Um, it basically says, if you are bothering somebody with how loud you are being, then you are violating the noise ordinance, okay? Which is sort of like, come on, that's like ridiculously subjective. So, um, and uh, yeah, exactly. like I am bothered all the time. Like I am the guy that call that like goes and knocks on my neighbor's doors, like shut up, or <laughs> like I get annoyed by the smallest little things. Um, but uh, a really good noise ordinance would say something like, you know what, you have not broken the noise ordinance until you have created enough noise to exceed 70 dB SPL, a weighted, at the location of the person who is complaining, right? So because we know that sound gets quieter as you go far away, you could be creating 90 dB SPL at your house, right? But you go across the street and into the person's house that is complaining, and maybe that's only 60 dB SPL over there, right? Uh, and so, you know, if, the, if that's how the noise ordinance is written, then you could take a meter and you know it's A weighted, so you have to dial in the weighting. You can't do it, if you do it at C weighted, then it'll trigger sooner, right? So you do A weighted, you go to the person's place where they're complaining and say, okay, have we exceeded that value? Yes or no, and if you haven't, then, you know, then you're good to go. If you have, then you have to turn it down. Um, that's, but you have to keep that weighting curve in mind. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's not fair. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, so that's one thing to realize, but the other thing to realize is that, you know, the, we generally kind of like to think that we want to, when we're designing a sound system, that we want to deliver all the frequencies to the audience and deliver them at the same level, right? We would like the audience to hear all the frequencies the same way. But if you understand this concept of the Fletcher-Munson curves, then you realize that you know, tuning your system to be actually flat does not mean that the sound will sound flat to your audience. Just because all the frequencies actually come out of the loudspeaker at the same level does not mean your audience will sound, that will sound to them as though it was flat. So what do you do about that? Well, there are some people who say, well, you should actually tune your system to be not flat. You should tune your system to be like this. And should you? It depends, right? So that's one argument is like you should do this. Um, and, you know, that is probably true, I think, for, I, I could entertain that argument if for live sound, mm -hmm. right? If, if all the sound that, you're, that is coming out of your loudspeakers is being created there on the spot, then sure. 
Uh, but if it's playback, guess what? Somebody who, is, who created that mix sat in a studio somewhere, and they mixed it to sound flat to them on their flat studio monitors. Right? So near-field studio monitors don't have curves like this. They're, they actually come out flat. And so you mix it to sound flat to your ears. And what sounds flat to your ears is this. So it's coming out of the, out of the computer already curved. So if, you, if your system is also curved, yeah. then it's going to come out sounding not flat again. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the one for um, that's meant for music mixing. Right. Which one of them looks quite similar to the way that it goes. So there are some there are, yeah, there are some efforts out there to sort of like figure out, okay, what's a good curve, like what's what's a good target you should use, and you could actually pop that in and use it. Um, and that's fine. That maybe could save some people some time. But like if it so if it is live sound, if everything is 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 happening live, then yeah, tuning your system to to do this could save you some time because you're gonna you're, you're going to mix it out of walk anyway, right, to try to get it to sound flat. And if your system's already kind of doing that, then that's less work you have to do. Uh, but if you have any playback as part of that, then you have to somehow do the opposite. And, you know, so it's a, there's not any right answer to, to any of these questions. It's just like you have to think about that. You have to think about the fact that we don't hear frequencies all the same way. Our sensitivity is different per frequency. And that sensitivity is different per person. Every person does not hear the same way. As we will show, I think we're going to have time. I managed to get us a little bit ahead last Friday. We might be able to actually do the hearing test as part of class. right? We're going to find out exactly what the sensitivity is of each of your ears um, relative to each frequency. You will know, you know that 4K sounds 3 dB quieter to you than 1K or whatever. Like, we're going to find that out. So that you'll know. That's important information for you to have. Okay. What's that? Yeah, for some of you, that is going to be a rude awakening, because um, maybe you've already damaged your ears by not taking very good care of them, um, and you're going to have a pretty bad day when I show you that graph. Um, and some of you are going to be like, "Whew, I haven't like." <laughs> Although. These things tend to show up a long time after you did the bad thing. So just because it looks good now doesn't mean you're not going to see the effects of the bad things you did. Um, you probably will. It just won't be for a little while. <laughs> but we'll talk about that in a minute. But all right, so there you go. Uh, let's talk about another reference level, dBV. V stands for voltage. So this is decibels that we can use to express voltage in actual levels. Uh, so again, we as a community of people who do sound have just decided that we're going to agree that 0 dBV is going to equal 1 volt. OK? Uh, if you decide that you think 0 dBV means 2 volts, you don't get to do sound. But what if I like, shore up enough support? You're just not going to get very far. <laughs> It's like, it's like we already decided this. Like the, the meeting already happened. Everybody, everybody voted. So you knock yourself out, but I don't think you're going to get very far. So 0 dBV equals 1 volt. Why? Just because. Yeah, it's, it's the because I said so answer. OK? Uh, we tend to use dBV to express voltage levels for consumer audio equipment, like things you would buy at you know, Walmart or Best Buy or stuff like that. Things that have an RCA connector on them, OK? Uh, and the, what we would call the consumer line level, the nominal operating level, which is like when the meter goes to unity on consumer equipment, that usually is minus 10 dBV, so less than a volt, right? Uh, voltage is a force, and therefore it follows that 6 and 20 rule. So you double the voltage, and you're going to go up 3 dBV. You multiply the voltage by 10, you're going to go up how many dBV? 20. 20 dBV. Very good. Okay. So uh, 
if we can agree that 0 dBV equals 1 volt, then we could also agree that minus 10 dBV equals 0 0.316 volts. Right? Uh, which is a helpful thing to know for reasons that, uh, that will become clearer in a moment. Uh, all right, another reference level is dBm, little m. And the little m stands for milliwatt. So in this case, 0 dBm equals 1 milliwatt. And again, no reason. We just decided. We had a meeting. We voted. And that's what it is. Um, this is, yeah, this was, you know, when I say we, I mean we society of sound. <laughs> I, I did not have a vote. I, I, I was brought to this table after it had been decided as well. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Um, it probably happened at an AES convention somewhere. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, generally, we use dBm in, in, when we talk about wireless transmission. So remember I said there's really two places where we think about power and watts. One of them is that space between the power amplifier and the loudspeaker. We, we sometimes look at that as though in watts. And then I also said in like your wireless mic transmission that we sometimes talk about in watts. Uh, but it's a much lower power level usually for like our wireless mics. So those tend to be expressed in milliwatts, or dBm. Uh, and the nominal level of that varies depending on you know what you're doing. Because sometimes uh, radio uses dBm as well, but their reference levels are a little bit different. Um, or the nominal levels are different. The reference level is the same. It's always one milliwatt, but the nominal level changes. Uh, so you might see, if you look up the specs for like a wireless belt pack transmitter or something, you might, it might say this many dBm or something like that. And you could do the math and figure out how many actual milliwatts that is. Um, and that can be helpful in some circumstances. So all right, any questions about that one? OK, here's another one, dBu, little u. There's a lot. There's more more than I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm just I'm doing a, I'm doing a little smattering of them here. There's there's more than I'm saying. The little U stands for unloaded. And you're thinking, it's like why un? It's like why unloaded? Um, well, uh, it. It's because uh, for a long time, uh, when we were still figuring all this stuff out and manufacturers were still trying to decide how to make sound equipment, um, no one could kind of, you know, everyone was implementing like their, the, the inputs and output circuits had really very different impedances, okay? And the impedance uh, changes, you know, how efficiently that energy kind of comes in and out of that thing. Uh, and so we were always having to do what's called impedance matching and trying to kind of make sure that the things we were connecting together had the right impedance relationships for that energy to trans transfer you know, effectively and efficiently. Uh, and that's, we used to talk about that in DBM, like that was everything was DBM, even on cables in between, you know, in between like your mixing console and your EQ or something, you'd th think about DBM. Uh, and that was really frustrating and really annoying. Again, this all happened long before I came on the scene, but I'm told it was really frustrating and annoying. Uh, and eventually people said, can we just like standardize this impedance thing? Like, can we just all agree that we're going like, to do it a certain way, and then we don't have to do all this math anymore? Um, and we're all sound people, and we don't like doing math, and we don't like you know, numbers that have more than three digits in them. And so everyone's like, heck yeah. Like, <laughs> less math, I'm all in. And so we sort of agreed that. Um, for line level devices, oops, you all right? For, for professional line level devices, we were going to standardize the input impedance to 600 ohms. Uh, and so 0 dBU equals 0.775 volts. Why? Because if, 
you put 0.775, we were trying to hit this one milliwatt, this zero dBm level. And it just so happens if you put 0.775 volts into a 600 ohm load, you get one milliwatt of work. <laughs> Which, remember when we were having this argument, we were all we, we thought about this in milliwatts and dBm. So we were trying to like line these things up so that the zero dBU would be the same thing as the zero dBm in our new fangled system. So that's why this 0.775 volts seems awfully arbitrary. 0.775? Why not 0.776? Right? I mean, <laughs> and it's because 0.775 into 600 ohms gets you one milliwatt of power. That's what they. That's why they did it. And the unloaded thing is like is that's their way of saying we don't care about the load anymore. <laughs> we don't have to do all that math anymore. We're just going to standardize that input impedance, and now and now we don't have to care anymore about what the impedance is in between our line level equipment. So that's a pretty high impedance, 600 ohms. Um, and they, that's, they, that was on purpose, because uh, high input impedance with a low output impedance feeding it is a very efficient energy transfer. Okay? Think about the garden hose, right? Where the, the water comes through the garden hose you know, sort of unimpressively until you put your thumb over it. <laughs> and then it's like, woo, right? <laughs> If you dramatically increase that imp that impedance. <laughs> yeah, no, my brother once he figured out a way. If he like totally like stuck his thumb in, yeah. and have like a little tiny hole on the side, and yeah. he like could do his impedance. Yeah. Okay, to be fair, you are a very mature banana. <laughs> yeah, I am a banana. <laughs> right, but that but that's that that same thing that works with the hose works with electricity as well. So, um, so that's what they're that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to put a really high impedance on that thing that that voltage is pushing against. So it'll come out the other end really with some serious energy behind it, okay? So uh, the, the nominal level here for dBU is plus four dBU. I don't know why, but, but if you do the math, that works out to 1.23 volts. And I think that's a joke. Just the one, two, three? Yeah. <laughs> I really think that, I really think this was a joke. They were like, uh, what should the nominal operating level be? Uh, check one, two, three. <laughs> yeah, that'd be funny. And then we'd all, only we would know. <laughs> we should like write that into the standard and then everybody has to do it. <laughs> I really think that's how that conversation went. But <laughs> Because that also seems awfully arbitrary. 1.23 volts, like, why? I don't know. The only, only reason is it's a joke <laughs> that I can think of. Well, it's voltage as well, and therefore it's a force, and therefore it follows that 6 and 20 rule, right? OK. Here's another one, DBW. <laughs> The W stands for watts, as opposed to the M, which stands for milliwatts. This stands for watts, which means because uh, then the numbers get really big, and we don't like big numbers. Um, you got to get used to it. Sound people don't like big numbers. We have invented like all of these crazy systems to avoid us ever having to deal with a number that has more than three digits in it. Okay. So, because uh, we really hate four-digit numbers. So, um, in this case, zero dBW is one watt. So, one watt is the reference level for dBW. So, if someone says, this thing is 10 dBW, what they mean is it's 10 dB more than one watt. Because this is power, it follows the 3 and 10 rule. So, you double the power, you get a 3 dB increase. Multiply the power by 10, you get a 10 dB increase. So if I said 10 dBW, how many watts would that be? Uh, ten. 10 watts, right? Easy. No. Wait, 0 is 1, 10 is 11? <laughs> 0 dBW is 1 watt, so 10 would be 11. Yeah, but 1 watt times 10 is 10. 10 watts, 10 dB. <laughs> Don't overthink it. <laughs> okay? So. Those are just some of the reference levels. 
there are some more that I'm not that I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on, but like there's a one that you might run into a lot on the computer is DBFS, DB full scale, and DB full scale is is means zero DB full scale is the limit of the digital circuitry. Zero dB full scale is all the bits turned to one, loudest level that comes out of the computer. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's uh, figure some of this out. How many volts is minus 10 dBV? I said it earlier, but let's do the math. So uh, if I were to express dBV in a actual mathematical way, I would say that dBV equals 20 times the log of x over 1 volt, right? Because 1 volt is the reference level for dBV. So if you plug any voltage you want in for x and run that math, you will get that voltage expressed in dBV. OK? Uh, so I already know the dBV, though, and I want that. So now I want to know the voltage. Anybody got any ideas how I might figure that out? Okay. Yeah, but remember, I, I, I taught you the, the, the formula already for that. Okay. So we can do, uh, we can, if we can figure out the force ratio for minus 10 dB, then, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we could do 10 to the power of negative 10 divided by 20. What's that? Somebody want to run that? <laughs> so basically what I'm going to say, what's, what's that? 10 to the minus 10 divided by 20? 10 to the minus 10. Do I need to pull up my PCAL? Let me show you. So in PCAL, here's how I would do that. That sounds more right. OK, so I would do 10. And then I would make that a negative number by pushing this magic button. And then I would say divide that by 20 equals that. And then I do 10 to the x, and I get 0 0.316, OK? OK, so um, so uh, 10 to the minus 10 over 20 equals 0 0.316, OK? So uh, if dBV equals 20 times the log of x divided by 1, then volts equals uh, x dBV times 10 to the power of the dBV divided by 20. <laughs> yeah? So we did this part. This part's the 0 0.316. So we have to multiply that by the db by uh, the reference level for the dBV, right? And what's the reference level for dBV? How many volts is that? Is is um, one. one one volt, right? So we're going to say bah, 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 mm -hmm. one. Okay. So what is one times ten to the power of one. minus ten divided by twenty? This will tell. This will convert voltage into dBV. Yeah. This converts dBV into volts. <laughs> okay. Right. So, I cheated ever so slightly because I wrote the dBV in there. But in reality, for dBV, it's just one. Right. One volt is the reference level. So, it's one times the dB ten to the power of the dB over twenty dBV, which in this case is negative ten. Right. So negative 10, 1 times 10 to the power of negative 10 over 20, 
Uh, we know the 10 to the power of negative is 0 0.316 times 1 is 0.316. So the answer is 0 0.316 volts. That is minus 10 dBV. So when the thing you buy at Best Buy, when the meter hits 0, there is 0 0.316 volts running through there. OK? Maybe you're thinking, why do I care? Um, I'll answer that question uh, in just a moment after we answer this question. So how many volts is plus 4 dBU? OK, well, dBU equals 20 times the log of x divided by 0.775, right? Because that, there's that weird voltage level, reference level for dBU. OK, so if we were to ex do the other way around, volts equals 0.775 times 10 to the power of dBU divided by 20, right? And 0.775 is, db, is the dBU reference level, right? So then it would be 10 to the power of 4 over 20? Exactly. So 10 to the power of 4 over 20 to, times 0.775. What do you get? Remember the joke. <laughs> one point two three volts. Check, check, one, two, three. <laughs> I, I don't I mean I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure. Like it's so plausible it has to be, that's why. <laughs> So now here is where the why do I care question gets answered, is how many dBU is minus 10 dBV? We'll start to answer this question. So uh, remember, dBU equals 20 times the log of x divided by 0.775. And x is a certain value of volts. So how many volts is minus 10 dBV? We just did that math. OK, so plug in 0 0.316 for x. What's 20 times the log of 0 0.316 divided by 0 0.775? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? What'd you get? Did anybody else get that? 20 times the log of 0 0.316 divided by 0.775. Okay. I want the whole thing. Final answer. OK. OK. 0. 0.316 divided by 0. 0.775 equals 0. 0.4 base 10 logarithm times 20 minus 7.79. OK. OK. So. Um, Minus 10 dBV is basically minus 8 dBU, all right, if you round it. So OK, great. Now you're thinking, I thought we, you were, this was going to explain why I care. Um, here's why you care. Um, let me, ah, here we go. So here's why you care. 
If I were to ask you the difference between the, the actual dB difference between plus 4 dBU and minus 10 dBV, what's magic about those two numbers? Yeah, those are the two nominal operating levels, right? Consumer versus professional. So we know that plus 4 dBU is 1.23 volts, because we figured that out. And we know that minus 10 dBV is 0.316 volts, because we figured that out. So what is the dB difference between these things? We know that minus 10 dBV is minus 8 dBU. So, but let's just run it anyway. So if we did 20, if, let's just find out the actual dB difference here. 20 times the log of one voltage divided by the other voltage, 1.23 divided by 0.316. What's that? Anybody? Anybody? It's 11 point eight. 11.8? So 11.8 dB. Or you could just call it 12 dB. OK. OK. Has anyone realized why we care? No. OK. So here is why we care. Do you ever plug something you bought into Best Buy, bought from Best Buy into the thing that you bought at an actual pro audio store? Anybody ever done that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Probably. Right? So the thing you bought at Best Buy, when the meter hits zero, it's putting out 0 0.3 and 6 volts. When the thing you bought at the pro audio store hits zero, it's doing 1.23 volts. There is a 12 dB difference between that. So what if, let's just do a hypothetical here. Let's say you had two CD players. One of them you bought at Best Buy. The other one you bought at a pro audio store. And you put the same CD in both of them. And you hook them into two separate channels on your mixing console. Set the input gains to the exact same level. Guess what? The CD that is playing in the one you bought at Best Buy is going to come into that console 12 dB quieter than the same CD playing on the professional one coming into a different channel with the same game. Um, and you could use the same scenario for any thing, anytime you're mixing and matching professional level versus consumer level gear. So now, why anybody understand why you might care? Well, you don't want the levels to be different, right? So if you know that there's a built-in 12 dB difference between the consumer level, level stuff and the professional level stuff, oh, by the way, yeah, you can adjust the gain, right? Mm -hmm. So if you know that that consumer level thing is coming in 12 dB quieter, you can boost your gain on that channel by 12 dB, and now they're the same. Yeah, Joel, just, I mean, on some equipment, you can just switch live levels. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Um, but if like you don't have that option, like, you know, if, if you've got something that has an RCA output mm -hmm. and then something that has an XLR output, those tend to tell you whether it's consumer or professional. Consumers tends to be RCA and professional tends to be XLR. So if you just know that there's 12 dB difference between these two pieces of equipment, you know, all, everything else being equal, you can then compensate for that by just boosting that gain by 12 dB on the other one, or the consumer one. So that's a helpful little thing. OK, so um, here's another question. How many dBm is 0 dBw? So this goes to Nora's question of like, why do we need dBw? Why don't we just do big numbers in dBm? Um, well, let's take a look here. So if we were going to do that, what sort of numbers would we get? So dBm equals 10 times the log of x divided by 0 0.001. Because 0 0.001 is the reference level for dBm, right? So you put, plug any wattage in for x, and you will get that wattage expressed in dBm. So what is the 1 watt, right? So we're going to put 1 in for x here. And what is 10 times the log of 1 divided by 0 0.001? Oh, I've got to align this thing.
Should be 30, right? Yeah. Yeah, not it's not, but keeping in mind that we sometimes deal with 300, 500, 1,000 watt power amplifiers. Now you can start to see why, OK, if one watt is 30 dBm, then you know, 1,000 watts, you got to add a couple zeros to that. And that's a lot. We don't like those big of numbers. So. Why are you using 10 times as long instead of 20 times as long? Because it's power. Okay. Good question. Did you guys catch that? So the question was, why did I use 10 times the log instead of 20 times the log on that, qu that equation? Because it's power. Because it's power. Right? Power works differently. So here's that question. Now, how many dBm is a 300 watt amplifier? We're going to drive this concept home now. Uh, so that would be dBm equals 10 times the log of 300 watts divided by 0 0.001. What is it? You could actually do this one in your head, but but run it on the calculator anyway. So it's 300 divided by 0 0.001. I get 300,000 log 10 times 10, 54. Okay. So we, we haven't got to three-digit numbers yet, but we're getting to bigger numbers, and we don't like big numbers. So anyway, uh, let's see here. OK, uh, we don't have time. We're good. OK, so everybody OK with that? So far, so good? Making sense? So a lot of the questions that I gave you in the little practice problems are going to have those little letters next to the DB. Right? It's going to say, hey, do some math on a dBU. And now you know that there are actual numbers that go along with that. OK, so uh, there's another phenomenon of uh, sound pressure level dB that uh, is a little wonky. And I just, because it's not linear, and, and hopefully you've realized that right now, by now, that decibels, because they collapse these big ranges into smaller ranges, that's not a linear scale. Right? Remember when we did the little chart and we went from you know, 1 watt to 10 watts and from 10 watts to 100 watts and from 100 watts to 1,000 watts and then from 1,000 watts to 2,000 watts and we only got 3 dB as opposed to the 10 dB we're getting? Okay? It's, that's what I mean by nonlinear. It's, you know, that 10,000 watts or the 1,000 watts doesn't get you the same thing every time. Uh, and so if you think about it, this, sometimes, this is what this looks like in the air. If you have two 90 dB SPL sounding things, two loudspeakers, both putting out 90 dB SPL, that doesn't mean that you now have 180 dB SPL. And if you think about that for a few seconds, you'll realize that that's true. Okay. Uh, because it's not linear, right? What actually, it's not that we doubled the dB, we doubled the pressure. And what happens when you double the pressure? You actually get a 6 dB increase for pressure, right? However, if you're talking about dBSPL and it's two sound sources, there's no way they are going to hit anybody's ears perfectly time aligned, right? There will be a time difference. And what happens when two equal sounds arrive slightly out of time? They comb filter, right? And so the comb filtering actually tends to knock 3 dB off of whatever that summation. Yeah. Yeah. So generally speaking, usually in when you're combining sound pressure sources, you get 3 dB every time you double the pressure. Um, and here's another interesting little thing. If you have two sources that are 10 dB apart, so let's say one last speaker that's 10 dB SPL and the other that is 80 dB SPL and you combine them, the listener will think it didn't get louder. Even though you added another 80 dB SPL worth of pressure into this equation, it doesn't sum together to be anything more. OK? So I think that's kind of interesting. 
right? How many times have we put a little fill in and pretended it did something? <laughs> Well, it's just, it's complicated. So, you know, for some frequencies, that fill's doing nothing. But for other frequencies, it's doing something. It depends, right? So we like to pretend that we can do these little subtle things and it makes a difference, and it doesn't. If it's 10 dB quieter, it may as well not be on. Okay? Yeah. But there's a whole lot of questions that come with that. 10 dB quieter than what? 10 dB quieter at what frequency? Compared to what frequency? 10 dB quieter compared to what frequency at how much difference in time? Right? These are all the things that then would you know, go into that, which might make it worth doing. OK, so why does this matter? Why is this something that we should care about? Um, uh, oh, no, hang on. I'm not ready for that yet. So think about it this way. Anybody play in the orchestra in high school, anything? What did you play? Cello, OK. So you, ha you got violins, you got violas, you got cellos, and you got basses. So how many violins are there for every one cello? Like eight. Yeah, a lot. There's more, right? And, and you're thinking, why does everybody want to play the violin? Like what's, like, what's so special about the violin? And it's not. It's actually that you, do, you actually need more violins. And here's why. So uh, let's run a little. Um, Let's run a little math here. So let's say that um, actually, let me. I've got a. I got some numbers written down here for this. Let me pull them up real quick, so I make sure I am able to make my point effectively. Um, so, oops! Wake up! Wake up! Uh, there we go, and here, and there. Okay. Oops. It's not coming up. So let's say that, um, that's not working. I'll have to make it up. Okay, so let's let's say that we've got a violin that, on average, let's say, puts out 70 dB SPL. That's how loud a violin generally is. Well, the cello, a single cello, is tends to be louder than a single violin, right? Bigger instrument moves more air, uh, so. A cello, I'm just making up these numbers. These aren't real numbers. Let's say a cello is 85 dB SPL, right? Well, generally speaking, you sort of want the cello section to not be way louder than the violin section, OK? You want these, all these instruments to blend really well. Um, so if one cello can do 85 dB SPL, let's just say at one meter, right? How many violins do you need in order for, for that to be the same? Okay, So if one violin equals 70 dB SPL, uh, if I just went and hired another violin player, two violin players, how many more dB do I get now? Three. three. Six, but three because of comb filtering. So 73 dB SPL. Great. So I hired one more violin player, salary plus benefits, and I got 3 dB. Wow. OK. What if I say, OK, I'm still not there yet. I need to get another one, another violin player. Then you're just overdoing it. No, actually. Why would you? Yeah. I have to double it again if I want 3 dB, right? So now I have to go to, I have to hire two more now. So now I have to go to four violin players. And now I can get 76 dB SPL. I told you these numbers are made up. It's not quite this, this big of a difference, but, yeah, but I'm just making my point, right? You've got a weird shape orchestra at this point. All right, so, um, all right, I'm still not there. Um, I need, I st if I want to get another 3 dB, now I have to go to eight violin players. Well, 
We'll talk about that in a second here. Okay, so I'm still not there. I want another 3 dB. I now I need 16 violin players. Yeah, so now I need 32 to get to 85. Okay, so uh, the difference is not quite that dramatic, right? I mean, the cello is not 15 dB more than the violin, but it is. Right. But it's probably more like six. To, it's probably more like six to eight dB difference. But um, but the point is, you need more, right? You need more. It's usually like a three to one kind of thing, you, right? Uh, but the real message is that. I mean, you don't deal with orchestras. They they take care of themselves. It's fine. They deal with themselves, but you do deal with sound, right? And the thing I want you to realize is that once the sound hits the air, your ability to do anything with it really just vanishes, right? Your ability to make anything happen after that, uh, and and by me by make something happen, I mean make it louder, right? Which is what we do. But once it hits the air, you're kind of done, okay? Because the things you have to do to fix it once it hits the air are like massive, right? If it hits the air and you need and you still need 10 more dB and you've done everything else. You need to buy 10 more sound systems, exactly like the one you've got. <laughs> okay, so uh, your point of can't they just play louder? Uh, it's like yeah, but like but that's the point. The point is tackling these problems earlier on in that signal chain gets you way better results than trying to tackle it once it comes out into the air. Once it hits the air, you're done. Okay, but I'd be willing to bet that you probably have that 15 dB hiding somewhere in your signal chain by just not very good gain structure. Like maybe you didn't pay attention to the fact that there's a 12 dB difference between this piece of equipment and this piece of equipment, okay? And you just forgot that. You could get 12 dB of free sound just by realizing that and, and just turning up the gain knob on that Best Buy CD player, okay? Uh, trying to get that 12 dB with adding loudspeakers, I mean, you'll, you're stupid. You'll go broke, right? So you definitely don't want to do that. So tackle it earlier. OK, another, another concept here, RMS. So remember that one time when I said, hey, you know, our sensitivity is kind of a moving target? Yeah. Well, it's even more of a moving target than I, than I was suggesting. And what I mean by that is that we don't hear the actual values, OK? Uh, and if you think about that for just a second, you'll realize why. Look at this graph. So here's a graph of a sine wave of air pressure amplitude. And we would call that a one volt wave. Well, actually, we'll say it's voltage. We'll call that a one volt wave. Why? Why do we call it a one volt wave? Yeah, well, that's where the that's where you know it hits one volt, right? Yeah, but how often is it at one volt? Hardly ever. Like it's almost never at one volt. It's only at one volt twice per cycle. The rest of the time, it's less than one volt. Okay. So if it's hardly ever at one volt, it would be no surprise when I tell you that if you turn that voltage wave into a sound and play it for somebody, they're not going to say that sounds like a one volt worth of sound. They're going to say it sounds like less than one volt of a sound, because most of the time it's less. Right? Most of the time it's less. Uh, if you take, if you do the math, which I don't even know how to do, uh, to figure out, to average all these values, uh, it averages out to actually 0.637 volts on average. That's the level of that. And it turns out that what we hear, the way we perceive it, is actually slightly higher than that. Uh, our, and it's called the RMS level. Root means square. There's some math that you don't need to know, that even I don't even know, that figures that out. But if it's a one volt wave, an actual one volt peak wave, that actually sounds like a 0 0.707 volt wave, OK? Uh, but here's the problem. Here's where it, this can, comes back to really 
bite us in the butt. And it's that when you get to a complex so sound, that was for a sine wave. When you get to a complex sound that has lots of frequencies, well, every frequency, that RMS level is a little bit different. And you've got a whole bunch of them. And so if you average that out, there is this huge difference between the actual peak value of that complex sound that you're creating and that RMS level, the sound that the listeners actually perceive. That difference between the peak and the RMS is called the crest factor. Okay? And that crest factor could be a lot, could be like 12 dB or more in some cases. So there could be a 12 dB difference between the peak of the sound, the sound you're making and the actual level that the audience will perceive. Why is that important to know? Yeah. So remember all that math that we started doing where we were trying to figure out how loud it would be at the seats? That's RMS level. If I say I need it to be 90 dB SPL at the back row of the theater, that's 90 dB SPL RMS. And in order to make 90 dB SPL RMS, I might have to make 102 dB SPL peak in order to deliver that 90 without distorting something. Because if you don't account for that crest factor, and then you run your fader up to hit the 90 dB SPL that you did the math to figure out, what happens to that 12 dB of peak vet levels? What happens to it? Yeah. And what does that sound like? Sounds like distortion. And, what, and distortion does not sound awesome, does it? Yeah, I mean, there are times when you like it, but but usually you don't, right? You, you know, you don't want to be adding extra distortion. Yeah, but I mean, like, the person playing the guitar is going to do that, right? You don't want to be putting more in. You want, you want to faithfully recreate whatever they did, right? So you don't want to be distorting any more. So if you don't account for that crest factor, you're in trouble. Okay, so now maybe you're starting to think about and realize why we have such things as 3,000 watt amplifiers. Because we were doing that math and we're like, 3,000 watts, that's like, you know, only need 300 to get the level you need. Remember that <laughs> equation we did? So why do you need the 3,000? Because 3,000 watts gives you 10 dB more doesn't it? <laughs> and 10 dB, yeah. <laughs> and 10 dB is on average kind of what your crest factor is. So um, this is why what I say is like we spend most of our time making and most of our money making a ton of sound that no one ever hears. Because we usually have a 6 to 10 to 12 dB crest factor we have to account for. And then we have to account for all the sound that's going to get lost traveling through the air. So to deliver 90 dB SPL at the back row that is a few hundred feet away, you've got to be able to create, you know, 120, 130 peak dB SPL at one meter away. That's a heck of a lot of sound. That's going to require really sensitive loudspeakers and a lot of you know, power amplifier that can do some serious work against that load. Uh, and you're going to burn most of that energy up in crest factor and dB loss over distance, inverse square law. And what's left is not even half of it. I mean, it'll be like an eighth of it that is actually left that people get to listen to. But you're going to spend just stupid amounts of money. <laughs> to create the other, you know, seven-eighths of that sound that no one gets to hear. That's the really depressing part of what we do. <laughs> most of the work we do and most of the money we spend to make sound never gets heard by anybody, including us. We don't even get to hear it. Okay? So, all right. We're not going to do this right now. So, um, uh, next time, we'll talk about what this does to your ear. Um, which I think is super important. So what happens to your ear when you hit it with 100 dB SPL? What happens to it? Let, we're going to find out. Um, so we'll talk about that next time. What's that? Find out next time. On. Okay. Any questions about any of that?
All right. So um, I, I, you should now have all the information you need to do all of the problems in that homework. But we will do some more examples in class later. Um, so if you get to ones and you're like, whoa, I have no idea. Um, you do. Like, I've given you all the information, but it does require piecing together three or four things that I said. Um, as though they, I, I presented to you, them to you as though they were separate things. Um, and you're going to have to realize that they are connected in order to do some of these questions. And if you can't quite figure that out, don't beat yourself up. I'll walk you through it later. Yeah. OK? Yeah. <laughs> 